Education reform is on the agenda for this year's legislative session. Governor Deal wants to peg teacher pay to performance in the classroom, but it's a proposal running into a lot of flack. And so is a proposed overhaul of how the state funds individual school systems across the state. We'll talk about this and more with the chair of the Senate Education Committee, Lindsay Tippins, and with House Education member, Ed Setzler. Lawmakers start right now. Welcome to Lawmakers and day two of the 2016 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Bill Nygut. Public education is one of the most basic services a state can provide, but it's also one of the most complicated to fund and to regulate. It's also one of Governor Deal's signature issues in his second term, so it's going to be getting a lot of attention at the Gold Dome this year. We'll get into that in just a moment, but first, an early start this morning for our Capitol crew with the annual Eggs and Egg Issues Breakfast kicking things off, Shelby Lynn has details on that and a lot more. Shelby? It was an early morning for the Eggs and Issues Breakfast Bill, and we'll get to that in a moment. But first, an update from Governor Deal on the Transportation Bill, one of the big issues from last session. With the passage of this Transportation Bill, we promised the people of the state of Georgia that we would show them results. And that is what we're doing here today. Governor Deal was joined by members of the House and Senate as he boasted about the first year success of the transportation bill, with hundreds of road construction and improvement projects around the state, adding up to a $10 billion investment over the next 10 years. In this current fiscal year alone, we are quadrupling our investment in resurfacings, nearly doubling our investment in bridge repair and replacements, and doubling our investment in routine maintenance. But critics like Senator Vincent Ford say the transportation plan is ignoring the need for mass transit. What we're going to have to do in the General Assembly, in the House and the Senate, is start keep talking about transit uh, as the as uh, the solution to this problem. You cannot build yourself. If we had been able to build ourselves out of traffic, that would have been done a long time ago. Uh, that is a discussion that will be ongoing, I feel sure. I think that the dynamic of the demands for transit are continuing to grow, and uh, we will see where that goes. Earlier today, the governor joined top Republican lawmakers at the annual Eggs and Issues Breakfast. They offered what they call successful strategies for growing Georgia's economy and a vision for the future of education and business development. Governor Nathan Deal touted the numbers he says points to a booming Georgia economy and credits local and county economic development agencies with helping spur job growth in the state. Since 2011, we've seen over 452,000 new private sector jobs in Georgia. And our unemployment rate has declined to roughly half what it was during that time frame to about 5.6% today. He pledged to protect film industry tax credits that have contributed to an ever-expanding movie business in Georgia. We might as well be called the Hollywood of the South as well. In fact, feature films and television productions generated statewide economic impact last year of more than $6 billion. The governor also called on community and business leaders to help improve education, especially failing schools. That's a big concern for Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle, too. Cagle told the crowd there is a disruption underway in the marketplace across sectors and that action is needed. The millennials of today are approaching education and every part of their lives in a different way from what we are used to. If we don't adjust, we will be left behind. House Speaker David Ralston discussed the importance of education reform, including funding the HOPE Scholarship and controlling college costs. The issues that we will focus on in this session will be those that are key to attracting businesses and residents to Georgia. As we know, one of the things that is imperative for growth and prosperity is high quality public education. 
Georgia senior Republican U.S. Senator Johnny Isaacson, who is so far unchallenged in his upcoming re-election bid, highlighted several issues in his address at the breakfast. He says the biggest issue of the 21st century is national security, especially terrorism. You know you can't negotiate with somebody that will burn themselves, burn you to death in the town square. You can't negotiate with somebody who will kill themselves to kill you. You can't negotiate with something that, somebody who will be a terrorist and attack your family. You can't negotiate with them. You can't deal with them. You can't bargain with them. The only thing you can do is kill them. And the faster we destroy them, the safer our world's going to be. And that's what I'm intending to do in the Congress of the United States is support this country and our military. We'll hear more from the governor tomorrow in his annual State of the State address. Now an update on the religious liberty bill Senator Josh McCoon is pushing. The chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Wendell Willard, says there's no way the House will be taking up McCoon's bill early in this session. If Senator McCoon wants to consider it at the appropriate time and makes a request, we'll give it consideration. But not before sure. crossover? I plan to. And it would take an emergency? If, if somebody tells me why it's an emergency, I say we've got a, a constitutional provision in our federal constitution, our state constitution, guaranteeing us uh, freedom of religion. I don't know where there's something happening that causes a need to enact this bill today. And finally tonight, an update on the push for casino gambling in Georgia. Supporters have apparently decided they can't get the bill passed this session, so they're focusing their efforts on next year. We'll have more on that later this week. That's it from the Capitol. Back to you, Bill. Thanks, Shelby. You know, our, our main topic tonight is going to be education and how Georgia pays for it, administers it, and keeps it accountable. It's hard to overstate how com complex all of this is, but we're going to try to make sense of it. I will tell you before we uh, begin talking to our guests that the governor still hasn't rolled out all of his education plans, so we're going to talk in a slightly broader way about the subject, what Georgia schools need. But I am very happy to have with us tonight our frequent flyer, Jim Galloway, political writer of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He is the uh, editor of Political Insider, which you read every day online. Also with us, Senator Lindsey Tippins. Uh, he is the chair of the Senate Education Committee. And also joining us, Representative Ed Setzler of Ackworth, who sits on the House Education Committee. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, Jim, as I said, we don't, the governor has not given us specifics on his plan. But we do know that for the last couple of years, he's been pointing us to what he's talked about as a major reform of uh, aspects of education, including the funding formula, right? Right, right. He's, he's going into the second year of his second term. In November, his Education Reform Commission came out with, its, with a huge report, many, many details, uh, a long list, and at the top of the list was, of course, uh, uh, tying teacher pay to performance standards. Right, what some would call merit pay. Right, that's, that's one huge issue. Uh, the, the other biggest issue, of course, is, is how, uh, how the state funds uh, ed education, how it takes money from wealthier school districts and how it shifts them over to poorer ones. Uh, we have here two representatives from Cobb. I'm from Cobb. You've got the Cobb Mafia here. I, I know, that, the, I, I know that, that our school board is already concerned about putting a cap on, on, on how much money can be drawn from, from their district and spent yeah, elsewhere. Uh, Senator, let's talk just a bit about that, how okay. the theory of all this operates that Jim set up for us. Yeah. Um, we're still operating under a bill passed by, Senator, uh, by Governor Joe Frank Harris back in the mid-'80s, Quality Basic Education, which set the formula for what Jim's talking about. Right. Wealthier school systems helping pay for the poorer school systems in the state. Is it time to rethink that formula? I know how controversial it is to begin that conversation. It's controversial, but the fact that that, that that piece of legislation has survived for 30 years, I think, speaks of the thoughtfulness that went into the design of it. I don't believe that that formula has been updated in prior years as it should have been, as times have changed. But I believe that as a uh, formula overall, it was very encompassing of the different challenges and issues in education, the um, the the concept of it of the local five the five mil local fair share is a big issue and just my county I know it I think the cost of that this year is 132 million dollars. Well, explain what that means. Well, that means of a. Uh, 
unfactored tax digest of the county from the earnings off of the formula for QBE, one of the last lines at the bottom is a cut, and they deduct, deduct the equivalent in your earnings of f five mills. And that goes off to fund underfunded schools? Not necessarily. Okay. The, by law, that that is the local contribution to education. Uh, the fact of the matter is Cobb County levies 18.9 mills hmm. and five mills of that goes to the state. Okay. So we're, okay. Cobb County is putting uh, 18.9 mills in. The, but equalization is a component as a, as a grant under QBE, the QBE formula, and it's, and it's complicated. I will say this, and I've told my uh, friends in Cobb County, and I served on the school board for, for 12 years, mm -hmm. If you did not have some mechanism statewide uh, to make some type of equalization between the differences in wealth per student between the counties, you'd be in the middle of a, a federal lawsuit that in all likelihood you'd lose and you may have a special master administering education in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. You, you, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, yeah. If I could, I mean, just uh, just both as both gentlemen. I mean, what what uh, what chances we have of in an election year? Of, of seeing something move on this, or is this something you put off until 2017? Well, what I heard, what, if you listen to what Senator Tippin said, th there's, a, there's criticism because of the age of QBE, but when you study the formula, it is one of the better funding formulas in the country when you really get at, down to how it accommodates for a whole number of, of factors. I have no, no doubt this session will make some tweaks to it. And I think you know, with, the, with the overwhelming passage of the Charter Amendment in 2012, where 58% of Georgians said they wanted to have the ability to have state charter schools, a funding formula that allows the money to follow the child more easily to, a, for example, a state-authorized public charter school. The, our current formula doesn't support that very well. There's some innovations in education that have happened that the old formula doesn't accommodate very well. But I, I do think the, the strength of the formula is shown through by being able to stand the test of time over these years. Well, let me just follow up on that. Uh, it, you hope that, or you, I, I shouldn't say you hope, you say you do think there'll be some tweaking of QBE. And yet, <clears throat> excuse me, the governor said he was going to do that last yet year mm -hmm. and decided instead that he would move forward with his opportunity school districts state takeover of failing schools, put this off, had his education task force meet. I mean, there are, it, it's a sign there are some political dangers here that he's certainly aware of, and he doesn't have to run for re-election. Uh, you all do. Well, Bill, I understand that, but I, I do think one thing the governor's committed to is, is to make some changes to the formula before he leaves office. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's introduced this year and passed next year, or parts are introduced and passed. I think over the, over the next two-year cycle, I do think we'll see some changes that are needed. Um, I, I wouldn't want to handicap whether it happens by day 40 or whether it's mm -hmm. the next year task, but I do think we'll get it started this year. Mr. Tippins, uh, you and I have both been around a, a good while, and, and when QBE went in, uh, and I was talking to Michael Thurmond, uh, the former superintendent of DeKalb County Schools about this, when QBE went in, it was, it was aiming, the, the poverty was concentrated in rural school districts. Right. And I know, in, in, in Cobb in, included, uh, we've seen that poverty move to suburban areas. Right. I mean, is that something that, that the new funding formula would have to address in a better fashion? Actually, the, the recommendation of the Education Reform Commission, I think for the first time in the United States, made a recommendation uh, that there be some acknowledgement of econ economically disadvantaged children and have a weighting specifically for that. I don't know that that's ever been done. It's my understanding that it's nowhere else in the United States has done that. It's statistically trackable that uh, socioeconomics definitely has an effect on academic achievement. Uh, a lot of that's manifest from the standpoint of a child's vocabulary, the size of a child's vocabulary when they start in kindergarten or first grade or pre-K. And there's a huge uh, difference from between socioeconomic groups as to as to what their background education coming in is. So. I think it makes sense. Let, let's move on to another uh, matter here. Of course, uh, Congress this past session has been worked on the uh, No Child Left Behind Act and removed some of the standards for uh, uh, what a lot of people think is far too much testing. 
Uh, and yet, right now in Georgia, to the best of my knowledge, no one has started looking at reducing the testing burden here yet. Representative Setzler, uh, the other day, uh, Superintendent Richard Wood, state school superintendent, uh, said we're, he, he said that we are losing teachers, uh, and you can read what he said right there, instead of a measure, pressure, and punish model that said, well, actually, yeah, let's go ahead. Instead of a measure, pressure, and punish model that sets our students, teachers, and schools up for failure, we need a model that personalizes instruction, empowers students, involves parents, provides real feedback to our teachers. But what he said was he thinks we're losing teachers because they don't want to spend all their time teaching to the test. Is that a real concern? I think it's a concern. I, I sp spend a lot of time in my schools, in, in my district, and, and get feedback from teachers. And I don't think they're, I don't think teachers in this day and age are, are afraid of accountability. I just think they want fairness. And we have not, we have not found the right balance of testing um, and and flexibility. Uh, I think we as a state are kind of in that back and forth wave of trying to fine tune that process. I do think we need accountability. I do think we need the appropriate amount of testing. But I don't think we've found the balance yet. How do we deal with this? You, uh, are, are, is it, do we need, uh, is it legislative uh, action that's needed? Can the superintendent act unilaterally? I think the, the school, the state school board uh, certainly can adopt regulations, but it makes more sense to me to, to more or less have a round table of thought between those in the local districts who have to implement this and get the best minds in the state to, to come up with a, with a system of evaluation. I, I do not think that teachers are afraid of accountability or a measure of effectiveness. I think that goes with any job or it should. Well, now, now but, here what I'm talking about, though, is what the superintendent was talking about, and we're going to talk about merit pay later, but what he was talking about was teachers simply think they have to it, they don't like the pressure of dealing with tests all the time, uh, Jim Galloway, and they, they have like a five-year lifespan here and then throw up their hands and say, we want to teach where we have more freedom to teach. Right, right, and we've got, and, you, and you've got, you've got, uh, that actually it brings us to one of the criticisms of the Governor's uh, uh, Education Reform Commission, and that was that you had principals, you had superintendents on it, you had uh, charter school representatives, but you didn't have any classroom teachers there. Right. And when you when when it, if you if you talk to classroom teachers and I do every day, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, they're just they're just flummoxed by the, the the amount of time that they have to spend hitting that target that target that target that target just because they know that their kids are going to be tested on it. Right, right. So just to reframe the conversation, Representative Setzler, it's more about do these do these tests take away from teachers the creative input they want to have as educators? I think there's such a difference in the subjects. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we kind of lift the veil and look at it, it's a whole lot easier to evaluate math performance <clears throat> than it is to evaluate performance in an art class. Right. Um, if we have an across-the-board standard that requires accountability for performance for art teachers versus math teachers, it's a difficult thing to do. I, mean, I, think, we're, I think that the recognition at the federal level that some of this needs to be dialed back is... is is indicative of a, of a need to have some flexibility in how we test, how we evaluate. I certainly am a supporter of, of principals being able to be in the classroom and watch the magic that's happening between them and teachers, and it be something other than a standardized test. I think the state's going to move in that direction. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, let's talk about this uh, uh, subject that has got an awful lot of people concerned out there, and that's the governor's proposal that there should be some form of merit pay for teachers, which is what you were talking about. We're going to continue with our deep dive into education legislation, including a look at that issue that doesn't ever fail to spark debate, merit pay for teachers, as I just mentioned. Lawmakers returns in just a minute. They were Hollywood's greatest stars of the 20th century. Their stories are legendary, from adversity... A scandal of epic dimension. ...to triumph. She made it look so easy. It's a series of intimate portraits and Academy Award-winning performances from the giants of the silver screen. That is a living, working reality. Hollywood Idols. Tonight at 7.30 on GPB. On Masterpiece. 
I don't want to be a servant on my wedding day. Is that so wrong? So the battle lines are drawn, and now we must fight it out. I hope you're not implying she would be more powerful than I. Oh, no, indeed. Mary took Marigold to the Drew's farm today. When a woman loves a child, it must stay with her. As you're all aware, this is the day of the Molten Show. Does it ever occur to you that you might be wrong? Downton Abbey on Masterpiece. Friday at 7 on GPB. Did you know that baby boomers are by far the largest generational contingent of the Georgia General Assembly? 52% of state representatives and senators are boomers, although just 28% of all Georgia adults fall into that category. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm here with Jim Galloway of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and also with Senator Lindsey Tippins and Representative Ed Setzler. They're both from Cobb County. So, uh, gentlemen, we're going to uh, get into this conversation that I have called over and over the third rail of any discussion about education reform, and that's uh, the whole notion of merit pay. Governor Deal is going there. He says he's ready to ask lawmakers to make a significant step toward tying teacher pay to their performance in the classroom. Uh, we're pretty sure that we know that a lot of teachers don't like that at all, but what about Georgia voters? Luckily for us, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution has a poll that took that question into consideration. And uh, here's what it show us, showed us. Uh, the AJC, Jim Galloway, uh, your folks asked, do you favor or oppose merit pay for teachers? 42% say they favor it, 52% oppose it. Uh, that's a fascinating uh, uh, figure. Um, in an election year, it's a real fascinating figure. So, what do you? How, first of all, before we turn to uh, our, our legislators, what do you make of that? Well, number one, I think there's recognition, broad recognition among the public, that education needs fixing. That we're not satisfied with with what's coming out of our public schools, but. You also have the the, 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 the the very real recognition by parents and teachers alike that in a public school system where you take all comers, you can't always determine the class you get. You can't, the quality of your student changes from, from, from semester to semester, year to year. Uh, you don't control that. Uh, and how do you measure uh, performance when you don't control the raw material? So we, I mentioned uh, State School Superintendent Richard Wood in the first segment of the show. Uh, he also weighed in on this. Uh, our Sam Whitehead, um, uh, reporter for GPB Radio, uh, talked with him, and he said he's not sure he supports uh, a merit pay for teachers. He says he needs a lot more conversation with teachers, wants them at the table. I know you haven't seen specifics on this, Senator. But I think it's safe to say this is a very tough, tough issue and a touchy one for that you're going to have to end up handling, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, as I said before, I do, do not believe that teachers are afraid of accountability. I don't believe that they're afraid of effectiveness measures. But what they want to guarantee is that whatever metric that's used takes into account the differences in the student characteristics that come into the classroom with each student. And some, some students bring very high risk factors. Uh, the, the big four that I always talk about is socioeconomics, transiency, uh, speakers, uh, English speakers as a second language, and special needs students. And there has to be some accommodation to realize is to, to it takes into consideration the differences of the challenges that are posed by those external factors that the teacher has no control over whatsoever. Over on your side of the uh, Capitol, uh, Representative Setzler, your speaker, uh, David Rawson, has already said he doesn't much like the idea of uh, merit pay for teachers. I proposed uh, on uh, Political Rewind the other day that one of the differences between Ralston and the governor's, governor's never running for re-election again. Ralston is, and he also wants to protect all of you who could get teachers very angry at you if you don't handle this issue just right. Well, it's, it's funny, Bill. You know, when I talk to teachers, in theory, teachers tell me, you know, I'm, I'm open to the idea of uh, merit pay, but the reality has to make sense. And the challenge is, 
can we come up with a plan that, that creates positive incentives where teachers feel better about um, what they're doing, that creates uh, the incentive for them to, to do even better? And I don't know that anyone's found a system that can really work to do that. I, I don't want to be a skeptic, but when I, when, I hear t when I talk to teachers, there's not this refusal to discuss, but I don't think they've, they, they've been convinced there's an actual practical plan that's going to make conditions better for teachers to incentivize better performance to incentivize a better education in the classroom. And I think, I think many of us are waiting to see what's being proposed, because until there's a solid plan, I don't think lawmakers can get on something that's, right, that's not going to work. Right, you know, clearly. Jim? Let me ask, it's, it's both, both of you here. I mean, clearly with, with, there's, with, with merit-based pay, there's a branding issue. I mean, you say that in a teacher, in a faculty lounge, and you are dead meat. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you, if we recast this, and let me ask both of you gentlemen, if you, if you were going to design a merit-based pay system, what would it measure? And how would, I mean, how would you go, do you, do you, do you measure advancement by students? Do you measure performance by students? How do you, how do you make this idea more palatable to, to teachers? Well, I think you have to make a differentiation between those, the, between the subject matter that is easily measurable. I think we have good measures for English language arts, reading proficiency, mathematics, science, and to uh, maybe a lesser extent, um, social studies. But those courses that are by nature subjective, it's hard to, to have an objective measurement of it. One of the mandates of Race to the Top was that you would measure student growth. It's hard to measure student growth in a course like art because I think you'll find the students that make A's are the ones who naturally and instinctively have uh, aptitudes for art. Same in PE. A student that makes an A in PE is probably the best athletes in the class. The same thing for music. Uh, it's hard to measure and show student growth because to show student growth, you have to have a pre and a post test, which I believe in strongly for those areas that you can do that. Are there models out there? As, a, as somebody who's been in education for as many years as you have, do you see other states where they figured out how to create a formula that works? Well, I think you're going to see as a, as a change in the reauthorization bill, it took away some of the mandates for those tests and in, st in the state of Georgia, the student learning objectives, which was for those classes that are hard by nature to measure, they are not mandated and it's left to the state's discretion, which is one area I think we need to look uh, very much at. Those is, areas... Is, is, it a, is it a matter of giving local school districts more uh, more authority over pay on how to how to divine divine a system that works for them. Jim, I think the goal here is to increase um, teacher retention. You know, we're, we as a state, as, as we are nationally, are struggling with teacher attrition. We want to raise teacher morale. We want to you know, increase the teacher's impact in the classroom. I would suggest, and this is perhaps just for discussion, that um, you know a model where teachers could opt into a merit-based system if they chose to. They could take a, a which fixed, I think is what the Education Reform Commission advanced. They, right? they, they could take a fixed option and continue to have that in a very fair, um, very fair compensation. But if there's a teacher that felt like they're in a circumstance where they could exceed and, and do better for themselves, perhaps give them that option. There's there's not an option now, but allow a teacher to opt in in a way that right. wouldn't undermine morale. All right, I'll tell you what. We are going to pa pause our conversation for now. We know the whole education reform plan is yet to be rolled out. And so, uh, you know what? Later in the session, I'd love to have you all come back here, talk about it when we see more meat on the bones of this session. But in the meantime, uh, I, I appreciate uh, both of you uh, for uh, being here, and you as well, Jim Galloway. Tonight, President Obama makes his final State of the Union address, and tomorrow, Governor Deal addresses a joint session of the Georgia General Assembly in his State of the State address. He still has one left after this one coming up. All of that means that we'll have a very special expanded edition of Lawmakers tomorrow night. We'll carry the governor's remarks in full, along with a Democratic response, followed by what is sure to be a lively discussion, breaking it all down. And a quick note, if you're a political junkie, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, Political Rewind adds a new show. You can listen to us on GPB Radio. We hope you'll join us for all of that and stay with us on Lawmakers in the weeks ahead. In the meantime, you can also stay in touch with us on Facebook and Twitter. Let us know what you want to hear about this session. You can always find us at gpb.org slash lawmakers. Thanks for being with us. Day two is a wrap, 38 more to go. Good night. <laughs>